to learn the truth and go with where God is going. And that, that brings us to the end of the presentation. We will open the room for discussions. Back to Don Wales. Okay, at this time, we uh, any questions or comments about the presentation? Tim. Yes, uh, Tagore, the uh, Ten Commandments. Now, they weren't part of the Sinai Covenant, aren't they? Because they were from the beginning. I mean, they were been in effect since the beginning of time. And so the Ten Commandments uh, is not gone. I mean, you know, uh, what's your comment on that? Uh, the two, they came... In two tablets of stone, part of Sinai covenant. Those are part of Sinai covenant. If they were given in a different form and shape to Abraham or somebody before the Sinai covenant, they hold good. But they have to be part of the terms and conditions of a covenant. Each covenant is a different covenant. It's a different marriage. We cannot mix and match. That's what my understanding is. Well, from what I've been having an understanding is that um, there was two basic, uh, there was two covenants during that time, a Sinai covenant and a Deuteronomy covenant, which the Deuteronomy covenant represented the, all the sacrifices and all the ordinances and everything that went with uh, when the tabernacle was set up and a new covenant before they went into the promised land, all of that was given to them that if they did, they would prosper. And, uh, but all, you know, the Ten Commandments was put inside the Ark of the Covenant and they're everlasting forever. Uh, I don't know, that's just my point of view of that. That is a shadow. The earthly tabernacle is a shadow. Right. You have Ark of the Covenant and the Ten Commandments and a jar of manna, golden jar. You have other artifacts. That's the shadow. And you have spiritual realities. You exactly you have a parallel under New Covenant. You are the temple of living God. Yeah. But the Ten Commandments are still in effect. Today. Not as part of Sinai Covenant. They are part of as part of new covenant, they are still in effect. You have to understand the distinction and difference between covenants. That's that's the fundamental thing I'm trying to drive. Okay. Chris? Hey, uh, I, I agree that the new covenant uh, replaced the old covenant. I just, the divorce thing, um, that uh, Israel was never really literally married to Yahweh. So when it talks in Jeremiah 3 about a divorce, it's out it as an al analogy or a metaphor. He didn't literally divorce them because by the end of the chapter, they're back together again, right? So it's it's a, there's a lot of analogies that play out in that with the thing. That was rampant in the uh, messianic and hebrew roots thing a while ago uh, where people kept misusing that saying that because the husband died the husband could get remarried but that wasn't husband would free the woman to remarry the husband in the in deuteronomy 24 never gets to remarry anybody he just gets to die right and then he's done right so when paul uses the divorce analogy Deuteronomy 24 in Romans 7, he uses it for we die so that we can be joined to another because we are born again when we accept Yeshua as the Messiah. That allows whatever gods we were married to before and accept Yahweh. So that way you know, we get to go through it. But the the divorce stuff is uh is the one where I, you know, I raised an eyebrow. But I did a lot when you said that it's impossible to go back to the old covenant because we do see a lot of people trying to do that. We see quite a lot of people trying to, uh, and I, that's what I, I have another message 
to send out here pretty quick. That's going to sound like I wrote it after Tagore talked, but it was before, right? <laughs> right? Is that there's a, there's a lot of people who are forgetting that when we come to the knowledge of the whole Genesis to Revelation, that we have to put it into the context of the New Testament and not in the context of the days of Moses. And uh, I, I covered a lot of ground there. Not as much as Tagore covered today, but I'm done. See you. Yeah, Chris, I respect your stand and uh, your understanding. I don't want to uh, trample upon it. But I see some verses, they seem to indicate that God himself calls, calls himself as I'm a husband to you, Israel. So you can you can say that it is a it is kind of a metaphorical. Uh, if you go there, Jeremiah yeah, 32, 32, you you know that those that verse. Uh huh. Yeah, but just just tr if we try to apply it literally, we would be part of the LGBTQ community. We are not literally going to marry Yeshua when he comes back like a bride adorned for a festival. We aren't literally a bride, right? So when he's talking, he talks about harlotry. He talks about adultery. He talks about husbandry. He's he language as, as, as euphemisms, as saying, this is like when your wife cheats on you. Right. We can't if we if we apply that literally, then Yahweh has way and gender doesn't apply. Yeah. When Paul explains the marriage between man and wife, he says, I'm speaking about great mystery, Christ and his church. You have this marriage thing both in New Testament as well as Old Testament, sprinkled across. Uh, it's, it's hard to uh, justify here, but that's the direction I see that God is saying that he is husband in both the Testaments. And uh, it's kind of marriage. It's not literal marriage because every covenant is a marriage. It's a relationship binding one to other. And it's a sacred relationship. You become a special wife. So conceptually, there are several uh, supporting uh, ideas, I would say. But uh, I respect your, uh, your take. No offense. Stan? Yes, uh, Tagore, I found a scripture that I believe does support your statement that the Ten Commandments were part of the Sinaitic Covenant, <clears throat> um, Exodus 34, 28. And he, Moses, was there with the Eternal 40 days and 40 nights. He did neither eat bread nor drink water, and he wrote upon the tables the words of the Covenant, comma, the Ten Commandments. As I said, if I understand this scripture correctly, it does support your statement that the Ten Commandments are part of the Sinaitic Covenant. I am done. Uh, yes, Stan. Uh, I'm, I believe the same. I see the same way as you are seeing. Uh, but if you see the history of physical Israel, God makes several covenants, one covenant on top of another with uh, more blessings, more things. Uh, but all those covenants, I believe it was Jesus Christ before that, Yeshua. And when he died, all of them were gone because you have to come to better promises, the eternal life. So that's my understanding. Uh, but thank you for telling us. But I'm not saying you can now break all the Ten Commandments. You can kill somebody or do all the nonsense. It's not. It's more binding and more strict. More the bar is more high under New Covenant. Um, Tagore, may I ask you another question? Yes, please. Um, 
I think you made a statement that the old covenant is gone when, when Jesus died. Did I understand you correctly? For Judah. Pardon? For Judah, there are two houses, right? Uh, house of Israel and house of Judah. Uh, this is my understanding that uh, Israel, he gave bill of divorcement. So Israel went through divorce, north, north and ten tribes. And the southern Judah was kept uh, until Christ came and he died. So that's how Judah lost his, her covenant. So is it correct? As Christians, we are under the new covenant, I'm assuming. Yes, I, I believe so. So would it be, and I, I know I might be splitting hairs here, but I, I was just curious. Because of that, is it, is it better to say that we keep the Ten Commandments because they are found in the New Testament and not to say we keep the Ten Commandments because they are in Exodus 20? Or is that irrelevant? Which, which source we go to as a New Covenant Christian? So as a New Covenant Christians, you have to adhere to the terms and conditions of that covenant. So you cannot switch between marriages. So if Christ affirms any of the commandments, they stand. If he is not, they are not standing. So it's a fresh covenant with fresh terms and conditions. And that is all the sum total of teachings of Christ. That's so, how the covenant works. So just to clarify for myself, are you saying that um, how do I want to put this? Are you saying that it is shallow thinking to say whatever the Torah says I will do, but better thinking to say if the New Testament shows that some of the practices in the Torah have been carried forward, I will practice those because the New Testament shows me that they are to continue. Is that better thinking? Correct. Correct. Because okay. new covenant okay. supersedes old. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Jim? So are you saying that the Ten Commandments came into existence at the Mount Sinai covenant? Because I've always thought them to be from the beginning because God rested on the seventh day on his creation and there was the Sabbath and uh, uh, Cain murdered Abel. All those laws to me has been in effect since the beginning of time. And I believe that God gave the Ten Commandments in the covenant at Mount Sinai because Israel had forgot and been in bondage under Egypt all that time and forgot all of that. And he had to remind them that, now that's how I've always thought. You are right in a way, uh, because Abraham was before, way before Mount Sinai, right? Yes. And scripture says, Abraham kept my laws, commandments, statutes, judgments. How was he keeping them? So there must have been given the knowledge and understanding of law before the Sinai covenant. But what Sinai covenant is, you have on two tablets of stone, the Ten Commandments were given. That is part of the Sinai covenant. That okay. covenant is closed. But what Abraham was a covenant with God, Abraham also has a covenant, right? That's the foundation for new covenant, actually. Okay, thank you. Where does... All right, we're talking about the different covenants and the Ten Commandments. How does Matthew 5, 18 fit into this? Matthew 5, Sermon on the Mount, he says, you have heard these things, but I'm saying this, this, this. If he's saying this, this, these things that become part of the new covenant, and if he's saying no, don't do that. It's not part of the new covenant. For example, eye for an eye and tooth for a tooth. You can't do that now 
under new covenant. You can't take vengeance because vengeance belongs to God. There are certain modifications. There are certain things continued. Those are part of new covenant. Certain things discontinued. Those are part of not part of new covenant. So the authority comes from Christ. Okay, so Matthew 5.18, where it says, Verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, one jot or tittle should no, way, no wise pass from the law until all be fulfilled. Yeah. The law here is the Ten Commandments or something else? The whole Sinai covenant, every sacrifice, everything, they are all shadows pointing to what Christ is going to teach. So, every sacrifice, sacrifice are, are taken away. But what sacrifices represent, this is how semion works, the Greek semion. The, the reality is going into a spiritual realm, actually. The physical rules are now interpreted as a spiritual principles, the inner spiritual movements. That's where the whole battle is. That's where all the character building is. That's where we make it into the new Jerusalem. That's the main thrust. Not that he's saying now you can do the murder or adultery. It's not the thing like what you are believing is not a big change in the sense the change is in the terms of dimension. The battle is no longer on earth. It is in, in, in realm of spirit. That's where the real change is coming. Okay. Chris. So, so when we quote Jeremiah 31, 31, um, there wasn't a Judah when the first covenant was made. Right. Correct. So, so. When he says, I'm going to write my laws on their hearts, and this is the covenant I'll make with the house of Israel, with the house of Judah, and he yeah. says, I'm going to write my Torah, right? Yeah. Hebrew guy, you're the Greek guy, I'm the Hebrew guy, right? Yeah. Right, <laughs> right. So, so he, he's talking about the same Torah being written on the hearts, right? He's not talking about like they don't have to be reaffirmed in the, in the new movement in order for them to be, um, valid or they don't have to be reaffirmed in, in the gospels and, and we could see this because when paul returns to jerusalem he's marching off to the when he comes to the jerusalem he actually takes all of the food that he brought if we didn't need that temple anymore then he wouldn't have done that right and he goes into the temple to make a vow which is torah right so he's he's doing a i mean he doesn't see when when they accused Moses, he he said, "Well, what are you talking about? They saw me in the temple, so doing." So I I mean, I'm pretty well. I don't know. I'm pretty confident. Twenty five years of preaching that that the Torah is still, you know, minus some obvious, you know, animal sacrifices and stuff. So I don't know. Maybe you could clear up the the difference in the covenants a little bit because I think we're all over here scratching our heads a bit, man. Yeah, I'm confused. Yeah, I have two things to say. One is, is in the intertestamental periods. So if he has taken a vow, temple was still standing, he's doing that. But Christ plainly declared that ye are the temple. Destroy this temple. So the physical temple lost its uh, status, lost its place. You are the temple of living God. That's a big shift. So what is the purpose of physical temple? It's our textbook. It's a shadow. We have to study that so that we understand what are our responsibilities. So Paul, what Paul did or did not do, uh, is not part of the new covenant in the sense. The terms and conditions are defined and ratified by Christ. He's explaining and personally he is doing certain things. I think he tonsured and shaved his head also one time. And he circumcised uh, uh, Timothy also, circumcision in flesh. It does some things 
situationally for the promotion of gospel, perhaps his obligations, but that's where we can't go and start the thing with Paul. We have to start with Christ and end with Christ. The moment you have covenant in your mind, the whole thinking changes, the whole convergence changes. That's what I might take. I'm not an absolute authority. That's what I am seeing, I'm sharing. Well, we do have we do have some some difficulties in in uh like what do we do today, right? But while the temple was still standing, after Yeshua ascended, they went to the temple to preach the Messiah. They still respected the Sanhedrin. They still Shabbat. They still continue to keep the Torah. There, we that's that's our way is pointing out the fact that they didn't basically turn into the Southern Baptist Convention after the Messiah. They continued to follow the Torah, and that what what Don is talking about until heaven and earth pass away. We know when that is. We know when the Torah won't be needed anymore because that's when the is down and there's no more night because the Torah is the Torah begins Bereshit Bra Elohim Alftav Shemayim Alftav Eretz in the beginning the heavens and the earth created right and it talks about the morning the first day right and so so when we no longer have days. We no longer need Torah, right? Because you don't have a night and a day, you won't have a Torah anymore. That's when all is okay. We're not there. The sun just set. It will be up tomorrow. Every time we have an evening and a morning, we have a day. And every time we have a day, we need the Torah. And I'm okay. Done. I mean, we can go on and on. What he told Samaritan woman at the well. Woman, believe me, neither in Jerusalem nor in this mountain, people would worship the Father. But the true worshippers would worship the Father in spirit and in truth. Because Father seeks such to worship him in spirit and in truth. So he's moving away from Jerusalem, temple, and he's, he's overriding all geographical locations. It's spirit. And then, uh, and the temple, he himself, after making this statement, he himself went and taught in the temple and overridden the, those who sell doves and oxen. And uh, why did he do that? Those are good, good questions. Because he's doing something to teach us. He uses that, that as a semion. The semion is like metaphor, simile, whatever. There's a Greek word. Yeah. So he's teaching all those things. Like, in fact, the Apostle John, he writes, all these things are semion. They are representations of something else. He's, he would be so cleansing your spiritual temple, you and me in a very similar way. So all the miracles, like opening the sight of blind man, it itself is not the end. It is a representation of something greater he would be doing. That's my understanding. You can always differ. Phyllis, the philosophy here, I think, is the divergence. Because, because I, I study it from a Hebraic perspective where, where, where we don't say... If something is a metaphor, it, it, literal when they can be literal, it's pardes is what it's called. Peshat remez derash so It means that if something is peshat, if something is is literal, like the Sabbath is literal, right? But then Peter uses the Sabbath. It says a day is as a thousand years, and we say we're going to have a thousand year rest. So that means it represents the thousand year rest. It's still the Sabbath. The Sabbath is still binding, right? It doesn't mean that the thousand-year rest replaces the Sabbath. 
The same way with adultery, when Yahweh uses a, as a teaching tool and marriage covenant as a teaching tool, it doesn't mean that he's replacing the marriage covenant or the, or something else, right? He's just using something that's commonly as when Paul says you don't muzzle the ox when you're when he's threshing. He's he's saying a minister can get paid to to preach is like not muzzling an ox when it's threshing. So we have different of scripture. We have to be careful when we say that something is just an idiom or just a metaphor, and we no longer have to do the the literal, because that's where my disconnect is here, is that a literal marriage is a literal marriage. We were never literally married to Yahweh. We that's that's not that was never a literal thing because it's literally impossible for us as temporal beings to marry an eternal being. Right? That's not there's no way for us to have a mutual two-way covenant with somebody who doesn't die. And I, I think I'm rambling, but but so I think our our divergence here is is on a perspective level, right? Not not really. Yeah, that, that's that's perfectly acceptable and understandable. Could there be a spiritual marriage that is shadowed by physical marriage? Just well, it's it just starts. Yeah, it's our, he's comparing commitment. He's committed to what he said. Israel agreed, just like Peggy and I agreed to love, honor, and cuddle. You know, we made a commitment. And until we do something really stupid, we will continue to keep that commitment. I think that's the point. Not so much the physical two shall become one, but the commitment. When you go down in the water, you die, you come up in a new as a new creation, and you are now committed to the cause. I think it's what I think it's what it is. The commitment is what he's talking about. Very right, very right. That's the basic basic requirement of any marriage, commitment and faithfulness. That's how the spiritual marriages work as well as physical marriages. I mean, this is a mega subject and um, we're dragging it out. Too. I can't answer all the questions. I can't ad address every disagreement, but as much as I understand, I'm sharing. And uh, I would encourage you to do your own independent investigation and research into teachings of Christ. That's what we did, Gospel of John. All this new temple, new worship, true worship, true worshipers, it came from his mouth. I'm not cooking them up. Mm -hmm. And waiting patiently in the wings, we have Aileen. Um, hi, thank you, Tigor. Um, um, I have a teacher be, uh, before, uh, I mean, he he stayed in a synagogue, a modern messianic synagogue, and he stayed there for 20 years. And even the rabbi would be the one to appoint him. And he's a Gentile, not a, a not a Jew. So the understanding he gave was uh it's actually the position of the priest and the temple sacrifices that were really done away with. Because the, the temple was destroyed, the priests were gone, all the sacrifices are gone. But the whole covenant is divided or the differently. There's some for the priests, there's some for ordinary people. And there's some for general. Every everybody has to do it. So what he explained was, it's the temple sacrifice. It's the these are the ones that have been removed and and 
Christ is the high priest. He is the only one. And then it's also said that we are now the, the priest as well. Or So um, there is no conflict of interest with the, the Torah, but only that the foreshadowing of the Old Testament's lamb and sacrifices has been replaced by Christ and that because of that the the role of the the high priest is Christ's responsibility now not the the people who are going to be elected in this other temple that's now coming so that's all done away so that's how he explained it and it, it does not contradict the new or the old because it's still continuing all the other uh, covenants. And as Tigor said and, and Christ said, it's even stricter. And he said there is even more um, laws or, or commandments that Jesus, Yeshua gave when he's alive than there was on the past. And I was asking him, uh, can you give the, the other new call? Uh, as you mentioned, like the eye for an eye is, and, and love your enemy is the opposite of an eye for an eye. So these are very hard truths that we have to adhere to and forgive our enemies. So these are... I think there's even more that's um in uh oh yeah and like you just look at the woman and you're already sin if you have lost in your your mind. So these are like expanding or or as you said, Igor, it's even a stricter understanding of what the Lord wants for us. So thank you. Uh, that's right. It's, it's not only more strict, it is the law is spiritual now. So it's not just physically killing a man, as you explained. If you despise a man or are angry with a man or a woman, you are killing. But he is going much, much beyond in the realm of into the realm of spirit that's the where the difficulty comes to understand his teachings he said the words that i speak are spirit and life and the flesh profits nothing he's going into that dimension and he's asking us to live in that dimension in fact another point to uh, chris raised this as sun and moon and earth are still there so we have those ordinances still there, but Christ is calling us not even to dwell on earth. You have to dwell in heaven. You behave and live as if you are resurrected spirit being. It's a tall order because those who dwell on earth, they receive automatically mark of the beast. Anyway, I thought I would mention that. Chris. So, so the eye for an eye has come up a couple of times. And, it, and Yeshua says, you've heard it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say to you, do not resist an evil person slap or the other. Also, if anyone wants to sue you and take your shirt, let him have your coat. Whoever forces you to go one mile, go with him too. And whoever gives ass of you, do not turn away from him who wants to borrow. So he's not saying repealing the eye for an eye law there. He's restoring it. Um, the the eye for an eye law was about restitution. And, and if we go to it, it, it says, you know, if men each other and strike a woman so she gives birth prematurely, yet there's no injury. He shall be fined if there's an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, burn for burn, wound for wound, bruise for bruise. He's not. It's it's not saying burn somebody 
that they you that then they should grab a torch and burn you the same. It's talking about making restitution. And over time it's misused to so where people are looking society is today. Our society today is very litigious and it's looking for like if you twist your ankle at the grocery store, you do you want them to to help you with your medical bills so that you could walk again? Or are you looking to get right? So the not repealing eye for an eye, he is talking about restoring it back to restitution. And to take it a further step is to say that if somebody accidentally pokes out your eye, you don't go poke out their eye. That doesn't restore your sight. It doesn't restore your sight to take their sight. It doesn't do anybody any good to have two people with only one eye, right? So, so compassionate. And this is a foreshadowing of how Yeshua bore our transgressions from the book of Isaiah, is how his, uh, he said, I didn't do anything wrong, but I'm going to die on your behalf. I'm going to take one for the team, and I'm taking one for the right? And so it's teaching us to apply the Torah in a compassionate way. It's not making the Torah spiritual. It's not ending the Torah or any such thing. It's saying that you know, you rules to make a restitution, but you don't have to do it. Just just like if a guy is is curious or jealous, he thinks his wife is cheating on him. He had the option of doing the ritual with the with the paper. He didn't have to do it, right? You don't have to go and retaliate. You have a choice to go back and get restitution, or you have a choice to shrug and go and move on. So, so this is not a change in any shape or form. It's him clearing it up and saying, look, you guys, don't, don't use the law as a weapon. Use it as a lifestyle. And I'm done, maybe, for a minute. Yeah, very well said. What he is emphasizing was justice and mercy, not the rule. So, Sermon on the Mount, that's not the only teaching, right, that he gave. He gave awful lot of things than Sermon on the Mount. I think like 10%, uh, probably 10%, just hypothetical, I'm coming out with that number, 10% of teachings have some overlap or some friction with the old old covenant. About 90% of his teachings are brand new, are taking us somewhere else. What do you, how do you account for those 90% of his teachings? You think what Yeshua taught was something new? Absolutely. Mm. Absolutely. You don't find that in Old Testament. Really interesting. There are tons of things. I, I was that's just, where, I was that's just where typing I'm in. crying out to the brethren and see what is. Take time and read slowly. So study his teachings. So so we did have um uh a guy who used to attend our, our assembly went through the Sermon on the Mount, and most of it is actually a quote. <laughs> it's not new. It's not, it's not new. Right. If you if you get the tools, right, you can do the commentary and it, and it, you can go through all these lists of things where these things existed before. So but but this is I, I'm not one of the guys because I, I know some other people who say, well, there's nothing new in the New Testament. Right. And they try to say, like, it's just Old Testament plus. I'm definitely not one of those guys. There's a lot of. Well, I wouldn't say a lot. But what is new is incredibly significant, right? Like the book of Hebrews, the changing of the priesthood, right? That's real. And, you know, and grafting in the Gentiles, real. The tearing of the the tearing of the curtain, the, you know, the ordinance as it were against us. That so there's not a lot that's new, I would say, by volume, but by but by importance, it's it's incredibly significant. Um but uh, I don't know. I, I'm kind of rambled out here because I spent a lot of time finding the actual 70% of the New Testament 
is Old Testament. It's direct quotes, right? I even push a Bible translation called NASB, which tells you when it's quoting the Old Testament most of the time. Uh, and most of the time, Paul, when you don't understand Paul, is because he's taking a, a phrase from the Old Testament and using it as a reference, expecting you to understand. War, there's a sentence that's completely out of place that you're like, How, what does that mean? And if you just click your little cheats and go to commentaries and go, oh, he's referencing the psalm or he's referencing the book of Isaiah, then all of a sudden it makes sense. And it's it, you knew, but but I do. I don't know. I'm shutting up now. I'm rambling. Well, I beg to differ with you. I believe 70% is new. Probably. It's very radically different. The battlefield is different now. You have the world cosmos and you have devil directly you are fighting against. It's a spiritual battle. It's a different battlefield, different uh, elements, different challenges, different rewards. It's totally different. You're not, you're not coming to that mindset, the perspective that he has brought in. You're so, trying to justify that the, what all in the Old Testament is just he repeated. He repeating, but every repetition has a new understanding, new nuances, new way, new direction, and new dimension he is taking in. If you carefully study word by word, line by line of his teachings, you would you would perhaps I hope you would see that. I, I'm, I'm grinning from ear to ear that, that somebody is telling me to study line by line. That's awesome. Just keep doing that. Right. Right. Because <laughs> I, you know, but, uh, but the difference here is that I think the battle was spiritual all along. I don't have a dividing line when the Messiah died, right? That, that Yahweh is, and Satan knew what was going to happen. Satan was trying to prevent these things from happening throughout antiquity. So, so while the Torah is literal, it's always had a spiritual aspect. It's all these things. And Yeshua comes and, and wakes us up to it, but I don't necessarily see that that perspective is a new perspective, right? The whole time when the when Moses well, the law was given through Moses, let's be accurate, right? And he said, eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. Moses was not intending people to use that as a weapon. He was intending people to use it from the day it was given. So it's not like Yeshua comes 2,000 years later and says, no, 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 no. This is what we, what me and my dad really meant was that you guys should be doing it this way. He meant, you, you should have been doing this all along, not and that you've strayed, so I'm going to set the path right. Does that, do you, you get what I'm saying? Which scripture says that, Chris, that he cannot teach new things? Oh, no, I didn't say he can't teach new things. Mm -hmm. I didn't say that he can't, right? I'm saying that he didn't. In, in this case, that's in a, this that's case, a unqualified. He Assertion. So, you, so, so you line think... by line, verse by verse, we can sit a separate session, and I can we can list out few things which you don't find it in Old Testament. So you think the intent of the eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth law was was retaliation until Yeshua came and changed it to be compassionate. That's one corner case where you are discussing the items that is overlapping between old and new. What about items that have no overlap with old covenant? There are bulk of them, many of them. You don't even want to go into that. That's that I have a problem. Why people don't don't take time to actually look into those verses? Why restrict yourself to Sermon on the Mount? There are tons of teachings uh, uh, he gave. Why don't you explore that? That's where, it, where my, I'm trying to have express my anguish 
as well as encouraging people to come there. Oh, I'm not limiting you. That's just the example that we were using. Yeah, you're you're good if you are not limiting yourself. Take time. I'm saying this. I'm I'm giving a testimony today that he taught awful lot of things than people ever knew. Neither Protestants nor COGs knew his teachings. They're obscured and covered up by demonic forces. There's a battle, spiritual battle. There is a reason that we don't study that. We are tripped off him and his teachings. Yet Bible clearly says we would be judged by his words. Why don't why? I think we should take time to study carefully what he is teaching. Objectively, don't, don't assume that he is just repeating old covenant. That's where I am. I am challenging you. You would find a lot more things than you ever thought. Somebody has to do that. I hate to be the one doing that. I'm just being quiet so somebody else can have a shot. Okay, well, <laughs> Alan all. has his hand up. I'm, I'm <laughs> already um, blazed <laughs> over the eyeballs here. <laughs> all right. Uh, I'm, I'm in uh, Hebrews chapter 8. We're talking about something that is completely new uh, concerning... Uh, moving away from Old Covenant into New Covenant. But now, this is Hebrews 8, 6. But now, at this time, he hath obtained a more excellent ministry. Well, why was it more excellent? By how much also he is the me mediator of a better covenant, which was established on better promises. Well, those better promises and that better Covenant are not in the old. They're not in the Torah. They're just not there. This is something new, and it's better. And I know, Chris, that you would agree with that part. For if that older covenant, the first covenant, had been without any fault, then there would be no place sought for a second one. So I'm going to drop all the way down now to uh, the last verse of the chapter. In that he says a new covenant. He hath made the first old. Now that which decays and waxes old is ready to vanish away. Why does it have to vanish away if it's sufficient? I mean, it's a fair question. If everything in the new covenant is found in the old, then why does the old have to vanish away? It should remain sufficient. Back to verse 10, for this is the covenant I will make with the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my laws into their mind and write them on their hearts. Well, that's something new, isn't it? No one really in the Torah, other than those that had the Spirit of God, the general populace did not have his law written on their hearts and in their minds. And they shall be to me a people, and I will be their God. They shall not teach every man his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord. How many people at the time of the Torah, all the way up until the birth of Christ, could say, I know the Lord? Did they really know the Lord the way the new covenant allows us to know him? Hey, brother, do you know the Lord? <laughs> As the saying goes. Well, the answer to that is no, they did not know the Lord. Not in the way that the new covenant permits us to know him with the indwelling of his spirit. Now, there were the prophets that did. But in a general sense, Israel at large and Judah at large did not really know the Lord. So these are new things that took place that came about. And they shall not... Uh, teach his neighbor or his brother saying, know the Lord, because they'll all know me. Every converted individual, everyone who comes into the new covenant, who is a genuine partaker of the gift of the Holy Spirit, 
is one who begins to then know the Lord intimately. Whether or not they grow that condition that they have is another story altogether. Whether or not they they take the uh, the minus or the talents and make them increase, that's something altogether different. But they know the Lord on the elementary introductory level. That is not in the Torah. The other place I would take you immediately would be the second Corinthians chapter three, which I'm sure you were suspecting that somebody might go there. <laughs> it talks about the glory that excelleth, right? I can uh, let's start Corinthians let's start want. here. I'm in Second Corinthians chapter three and verse seven. Because there certainly was a glory in the Torah. There certainly was a glory in, in the nation who, when they were obedient, were a model nation. And the surrounding nations say, what, a, what, what kind of a God do they have who does all these things? So wise a God it must be. But here I am in uh, 2 Corinthians 3, 7, where it's called the administration of death. Well, that's not good, is it? <laughs> Come on. <laughs> it was the <laughs> ministration of death uh, written and engraved on tables of stone was glorious. Yes, it was glorious. So that even the children of Israel could not look at Moses because of the glory of his countenance when he had to put the veil over his head. Which, by the way, the glory was to be done away. Oh, okay, so the former glory is to be done away. Yeah, that's right. How shall not the ministration of the Spirit be exceedingly more glorious? For if the administration of condemnation be glorious, which it was, much more, far more does the administration of righteousness exceed the glory of the old. For even that which was made glorious in the first, it had no glory when contrasted against the new, which excelleth, excels far beyond. So these are new things. The, the glory of the administration of, of the Spirit, which gives life, as it says back in verse 6, it is way far uh, ahead of, and it is a new thing. Oh yeah, there was a shadow, for sure, there was a shadow. But the shadow was just that. It was not this new thing. Seeing then that we have such hope, we use plainness of speech. And not as Moses, which had to put a veil over his head, that the children of Israel could not steadfastly look at the end of it of that which is abolished. Well, if something is abolished, there must be something new to take its place. But their minds were blinded until, uh, until the veil is taken away in Christ. So we kind of see this uh, running theme here of something being uh, done away and something new taking its place. But even unto this day when Moses is read, the veil is still on their heart. Wonder why? Because they can't know the Lord in the reading of Moses. <laughs> they said, we have Moses. Remember? Oh, yeah, you have Moses. But if you really believed him, you would have believed me. All right. Um, now, the Lord is that spirit, and where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. But where the Torah is, there is not liberty. It is the administration of death. You sin, you die. But this is an administration of the mercy of God. You get caught in adultery today, you don't die for that. That's all I got to say about that. Chris? 
so so i'm not i'm usually on the other side of this this discussion right where people try to thing new in the new testament and i'm like whoa hold on right there's all there's new stuff there's all kinds of new stuff in the new testament right obviously and there's things that we just read but i wish alan would have stopped at the phrase where he said to moses you would believe me because when when the faith went forth from jerusalem and it went out how did they validate it they validated it with the old testament in the the Berians searched the scriptures to see if those things were so. So, so if we come out from this saying that there's just brand new religion called Christianity, right? They don't have anything to validate. So when if we take the track that Yeshua, he did, it is a new covenant, right? I know there's a bunch of people out there who say it's a renewed covenant, or re renewed meaning that that nothing has changed. That's not right. It is a new covenant, right? And that's even what Jeremiah 31, 31 says. But the new covenant only is a new covenant if you have everything that came before being fed and building on it. If you come at the first century and you say, okay, all this stuff is new, nobody had it before, the ultimate conclusion is that everybody who lived before then uh, tricked that Yahweh was messing with them, that they didn't have to do anything, that, oh, th that law is spiritual now, you idiots, you fools who took all the goats to the, to the thing, you Rubicons, you guys didn't have to do none of that, right? Because now the, the Messiah has come, Right? Did it's all spiritual. And you did all, all that work for those two, three, four thousand years just so I could erase it all and make something new that's completely different from what it was before. That is not that's not what happened. The faith from Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Yeshua continues for six thousand years. And we have changes, and we have better revelation. We have better, we have expands. We have things put into context, and we have new information at the same time. And then we we continually build towards the return of the Messiah. What's going? You guys do believe that we're some temple thing in the millennium, right? Just nod or shake your head. Right, because the Bible says we're going to have a temple in the millennium, and if you don't go there, you're not getting any rain. So we have a verse in Zechariah 14 to explain our our lifestyle today. So if we say, "Well, it's that spiritual temple," you ain't got to go anywhere. Then everybody's getting rain, and none of it makes any sense. Well, Chris, you know, some things are just hard to understand. <laughs> In reply to your uh, comments, yes, it, it, it is kind of uh, difficult to piece that together, the, the temple uh, in, in the millennium, millennial period. Uh, we, when we read about it and we try to um, understand how how and why that is, uh, we have a lot of conjecture, uh, but it certainly isn't to go backwards because we don't, uh, we don't see the value today in going backwards into uh, what was a, a, just a pattern or you know, the, uh, the shadow. You know, we, we, we read in, uh, in Colossians that you know, those things, uh, the Sabbaths and new moons and the holy days and uh, meat and drink and all that, these are, these are shadows of things to come. But the substance, it says, is of Christ. So do we go from Christ back to the shadows? Is that why we have the temple in the millennial period? I don't understand it. 
And I, I can't piece that together other than that the nations need this for foundational purposes. And that was the conjecture. They need this uh, basic intro before they can come from the shadow to the authentic. Before they can say, yes, I know the Lord. Before they can do that. Of course, Israel had an opportunity to do that for how many years and still dropped the ball. So it's, it is difficult to piece together. And you have a valid question there. Okay. Um, put my hand down here. Millennial Temple, Ezekiel's Temple. When you look at it, it's a transitional temple. It has elements. Of the old, and it has a layout and pattern of New Jerusalem. The river, the temple, the layout is similar to New Jerusalem. It's a transitional temple. It teaches. It's kind of like, and there's the promises. David shall be their king. They shall have a temple. They shall have the peace. The people and land uh, of, of your foreigners should pass through the land. You've got the highway. That talked about in Ezekiel. You've got all these promises God made. He has to fulfill them. He promised them he would do this. The sacrificial system is different. Before the people would bring the bring the, the, the offering or whatever in Ezekiel's temple, it comes from the graze, the, the, the hundreds of miles of graze land. Around the temple, the king provides the sacrifice. Everyone eats of it. You, the temple is made to pass lots of people through it. People from the north go out the south. People of the south gate go out the north. You come, you see the glory. You bow down and you worship it. And on your way out, you stop at the McDonald's, if you will, you know, the flesh pots, and you have a bite to eat. You have something to drink, and out the door you go. Is a totally different temple. And I think it's to fulfill the promises that God gave to Israel, the physical promises. It's to acknowledge, continue to acknowledge God's love for, for uh, King David, because he'll be constantly out the East Gate. Um, and it's a transition. You, you have the water coming from the temple. You have the river. That's in, in that you find in the New Jerusalem. There's elements in the, that temple that are in the New Jerusalem. So I think it's a transitional temple for a transitional period to bring the physical and the spiritual together. Because you're going to have people that are going to be so hung up. Oh, we got to have a temple. We got to have this. We got to have that. Fine. He gives it to them. And then during that time, they're taught, hey, wait a minute. This is spiritual. This isn't just a physical thing. So that's my opinion on the whole Ezekiel 40 through 48. It's a transitional temple. Chris. I think I forgot why I put up my hand. I'll put my hand there. Okay. What, were you agreeing with me or not agreeing with me or what? I, I, yeah. Oh, all right. Uh, yeah. Well, that was, I guess, a, I, I was just throwing that out there because um, um, I lost my train of thought because the girls are upstairs singing and baking something. So um, take that for what it's worth. Uh, but uh, the, uh, the, the spiritualizing um, is true. And I, I just don't think that it's an either or proposition, right? That's that's the that's my take on it. And that reference part S, it means that you have these layers of scripture that when something is literal, it stays literal. Oh, yeah, I remember why I put my hand up. We actually have a prophecy as the Daniel prophecy about daily sacrifice coming to an end points to Yeshua. And the next sentence talks about the temple coming down. And desolations are determined, right? So what where we are is prophesied, right? It's it's we are in the end of this period of time where we really don't know what to do with ourselves, right? We have the Torah, we know we're supposed to be keeping the Torah, but we can't. 
And then we don't even really know what to do with it because. And so we, we're kind of, there's lots of, I don't knows. There's lots of, I don't knows. And when he comes back and we get a temple, what are we going to do with it? What's the point? You said it's a transitional temple, right? It's all just for free will offerings. Maybe it's just, I, we don't know yet. And I don't know. I don't know. Those words are a, are a um, what do you call it? A satisfactory answer, right? Because we don't know those things. But today we know how we're supposed to behave. That's why my ministry is called first century Christianity, right? Because we know what they did and we know ex we know what they did what we know what they did is because of the ecumenical councils that were trying to get them to stop doing what they were doing writing them letters to stop keeping the sabbath stop reading the torah stop right they want them to not do those things because they were trying to spiritualize everything right Right, they're trying to say you don't have to do that stuff anymore. It's all spiritual, right? But if you continue to keep the Sabbath, and we add in the spiritual la layer, that's where I think we need to be, right? Keep doing the literal, and add the spiritual. Don't don't turn a corner and say, oh, that doesn't right. New moons and Sabbaths, psh, that's a shadow of things to come. Let's go. Let's go over here and have us a ham sandwich on Saturday, right? Because it's all spiritual now. You don't have to do it anymore, which I don't think I know from life that that's not what he's saying, right? But others may hear him say that and go, what are you doing, right? But I know that Tagore is not, not going to go have a ham sandwich on Shabbat, <laughs> right? He's not going to. That's the point. But yeah, the, the Ezekiel Temple is a, obviously... A transitional period because when we get to the end of the millennium there's no more temple there's no more day there's no more night and there's a lot of i don't know done and by the way tomorrow's word is happy <laughs> Be happy to be there. <laughs> well, it was a good discussion. I think I we, all it all. Unhappy. we all agree. It's just we're seeing it from different points. I hope nobody's unhappy. We're just talking. Any other thoughts, ideas, questions about the presentation? Well, how did we get off on that anyway? I, I'm, I can't remember what, what did Tagore say that we, we discussed that. I don't remember. I think it got off to the was that the New Testament is mainly new. There's no old. Or no, oh, 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 yeah. Oh, yeah. That was that was where this went. Yeah, I have I have all kinds of notes. Um, I, I you know thinking back hours and hours ago, uh, when uh, Tagore was talking about the canon of the New Testament, that is that is something that we don't talk about once here, and uh, that is a a mess. That's that's what that is. The new the New Testament canon is a mess. The Old Testament canon. That is a slam dunk. Where that came from, when it came into existence, and it's it's pretty that's pretty static. But how how we got the New Testament canon? That's uh maybe Tagore would like to talk about that one because that's not clean at all. Well, I'm pretty sure King James uh, made the decision, and that was it. <laughs> no, no, no! You got to include the Book of Enoch to have it. <laughs> okay, okay. Don't, don't forget I, Jasher. <laughs> I, the Book the of Mary, King James Bible. Um, yeah, yeah, I got a big argument on on uh, Twitter 
because people think that the King James Bible, one guy even told me it was the first English Bible. And I'm like, what are you talking about? It was an answer to the Geneva Bible. <laughs> I'm like, what, 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 how two day long conversation. And I'm just figuring out that you don't know thing one, but the, the King James Bible is, um, is it shouldn't be read. I'll I'll just I'll show it to you. It, it's I I don't like reading Bibles where people want to tell me what to believe. And if we go, here's the King James KJV, right? And we go to John five. It's the most glorious Bible that was ever written. Twenty nine. It's wrong, and it's it, <laughs> it's just wrong. And they shall come forth, they have done good to a resurrection of life, and they who have done evil to damnation. Here's the problem. This word damnation doesn't exist. It's not real. Okay, Tagore knows this. He's already grinning, right? In this chapter, they translate the same exact G2920 crisis three ways because they are pushing a doctrine on you. They did not translate this Bible as a translation. This is a Church of England doctrinal document. G2920, right here, if we just go up a little bit. Let me minimize you guys so I can see it all. Uh, judgment, G2920, is crisis. Twenty is damnation. If we go up to condemnation, oh, here's judgment, right? If you look through here, they take G2920 and they call it judgment, condemnation, and damnation. When the Messiah was saying the same, they tell you he was saying three different words. That's crazy. Yeah. Well, it's common, though, that uh, many of uh, the Strong's numbers are translated into many different words. You know that. In the King James, I use this one, where they're not. Right, right. I don't. When I learned that, when I learned that they were tr they were trying to teach us, judge equals damnation equals condemnation. When I learned that they were translating the Messiah's words differently, I moved on. I'm not. I'm not going to. I'm not going to be lied to. Same well, reason that I don't use this thing, right? This 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 scriptures thing. Right, that somebody made in the 21st century, they is lying to you too. Right? Who, why would you? Why is, would you read lies? Who who is lying to you? The well, the King James primarily, but okay. this, uh, uh, this the scriptures, any Bible translation that that isn't just letting you make your own decisions is you know done. Okay, I got to Gore. I got to Gore talking now, so I'll shut up. Uh, this is obviously bad translation, Chris, but your underlying assumption, every Greek word should be translated to same English word every time. That's not possible. Like Greek words have semantic range. They have more than one meaning, sometimes three or four meanings. So which one do you use? I asked my Greek teacher. He says like language does not dictate it and the context you decide. So the translators do decide to pick one in the range than the other. So that's where you have translation difficulties. And, uh, but I don't think crisis is damnation. So that's obviously or in 1611, damnation and condemnation are same. Who knows how the English language evolved over 500 years. So, so, well, so this is this is more advanced because Hebrew Hebrew only has like 2300 words total, right? So Hebrew uses that word to to mean completely different things pretty often and you have to learn to look at the context. The problem with John 5 is between verse 19 and 29 they say that when Yeshua 
that he means that he's using this word differently three times. That's not possible. That's not, that's not, that's like me saying, this is a car. This is a stapler. It's a granite, right? Right. <laughs> three totally different th meanings for the same exact word in the same discourse. Right now, later on in the Bible, I, my exhaust is on, on judgment. Right. My, later on in the Bible, they, they use crisis different. They use crino, crisis, catacrino. It goes on and on, right? It's verb conjugations and all this and that, right? You have to look at the context. The context is one discourse. <laughs> he is not saying three different words in one discourse. It's not happening, right? Some men in 1609 decided to represent doctrine for the most important words that the Messiah said, right? The most important words. What do we want to do? We want to be in the resurrection of life. Be in the first resurrection, right? Amen? You guys can say amen. You could nod. Yeah. Thumbs up. You guys want to be in the, the right? We want to be in the first resurrection. They are misrepresenting the first resurrection, the second resurrection. Horrible, right? What worst thing could they do? I'll lay that question on you. What worst thing could they do with the word of God? Well, it, it's true, true that the King James is also a little heavy handed on authority. Um, Psalms 8 5. I'm sure if they would have translated that properly, their head would not be part of their bodies, <laughs> which is, um, for thou hast made him a little lower than the angels and has crowned him with glory and honor. And it's really, yet he has made him a little lower than God. Can you imagine? Oh, your subjects are equal to you, O king. <laughs> that translator would be definitely missing right. his head. Right, because, because what's common language is that they had 14, depending on how you number it, 14 or 15 rules that they had to follow translation because they did not like that the Geneva Bible was a little bit more on the straight shooting, you know, thing. So... But that's that's I forgot how we get on that one too, right? Whatever. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I wish someone would make a new Geneva Bible that's in English. Well, you're talking about the canon. That's why we started the, the canonization. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. The problem, Chris, is yeah. uh, the version you use also has bias built into it. So the way words are translated uh, will be according to the bias of the uh, of those doing the work. You can't really escape that. There is not a perfect English translation. It just isn't. Yeah, you're right. You're right. But these guys in the front of their Bible tell you when when they have to add, see how right here they put in italics, right? They tell yeah. you when they're adding words to make things different. They tell you that L-O-R-D all caps. They tell you that, right? So, mm -hmm. so it's not, it's the least worst option rather than saying that there's a perfect one, right? Which is why we have this thing, right? Can you guys, oh, it is, okay, in the, uh, right, <laughs> right, you know, what version are you, what version is your preference, Chris? In NASB, in but, uh, but there's others, there's others that do the same thing. That's just the one I landed on, but then, you know, these, this is an interlinear as well. We can switch it to, uh, or we could do something that Tagore is more comfortable with is the APB plus. The APB plus Apostles Bible Polyglot has her Bible from Geneva, from Genesis to Revelation in Greek with the Strongs. So you can have Strongs numbers in Ezekiel for Greek words, not for English words, right? This is huge. Is this for is in the New Testament was written in Greek, and you can use this as a bridge 
to get right. back to Hebrew. Yeah. Or in Tagore's case, you could just stop right here and know what it's talking about. <laughs> right. So, yeah. At any rate, I can. Is there, is there yeah, I wish we had the perfect one, but, you know, it's we got to work with what we've got. Now, there are certain uh, inherent weaknesses with the NASB as well. And what I can come back. Uh, I have a book that does comparisons of all the modern translations and tells you all the weaknesses of each one. I can send I can send you some images of, of that uh, the pages that show why the NASB also is uh, got flaws in it. Oh no, it has flaws, and it has flaws. And earlier I was talking about how it uh, it quotes the Old Testament in blocks. So if you're in the New Testament, I'll just grab something at rem, and if you see something in all bold right here every knee will bow right it likes to make note of every time uh it the new testament is quoting the old they miss a lot they miss a lot of it there's a lot of times where the new testament is quoting the old and they don't have it in there i'm not i'm not saying that this is like the best but at least they tried right <laughs> right <laughs> at least they tried not to push push Right, because all the doc, all the translators are Trinitarian, right? They're all Trinitarian. Uh, most, I would say, probably most of them, yeah. Right, but only the, the King James has. The King James is the only one they changed to say whatever. Right, the King James is the only one that has the false Trinity teaching in it. Right, nobody else put that in there. You know. So. Anyway, uh, sorry, I'm. You guys might not invite me back for a while. I'm shutting up now. So you've been banned. <laughs> you gotta be put in Zoom jail. <laughs> That's it. Yeah. I'm gonna get the Zuckerberg treatment. I'm looking. Oh, it's because I hogged the screen too. Look at me go. All right. <laughs> hey, uh, have y'all seen this translation? Hallelujah scriptures. Yeah. No. That looks like Paleo Hebrew. Well, yeah, yeah, it's, they have one. This is in English. It's supposed to be from the original. I just got it about a month ago. And uh, it don't use Jesus or God or Lord or none of that. It uses all the uh, uh, original names like uh, Yahweh and Yah and uh, uh, Yeshua and anyway, it's got uh, uses all the Hebrew names for people's names, and it comes with a name meanings book, also, and it comes with a the Torah of Yahweh book. It's all free to people that can't uh, afford it, but if you can afford it, they want you to send a donation. But the uh, place it comes from is Laird, Virginia, in Virginia, and they send out free copies around the world from donations. They won't sell it, but they'll take a donation. And they believe group, in the Sabbath. Who publishes that? Do what? Who is the publisher? Well, it's uh, hallelujahscriptures.com if you want to go check it out. Okay. How do you like it so far? Well, uh, I have to pull out the names meaning book every now and then to some of the names. Like, uh, uh, of course, I've learned some of them. Like, they use Ben for son, Hi for life, uh, you know, just different. Uh, uh, I forget what it's Shinny. I don't know how to pronounce some of them. For heavens, they don't use heaven. They use uh, what is it? Shinim or however you pronounce it. And then. Uh, but it, I like it so far. I try to compare it with like you did with the uh, King James in um, what was it? Colossians 5, 9, uh, 29. Was that the one you just brought up? Or John 5, 29. John 5, 29. Yeah. And it says judgment and life and judgment. And it, it don't say uh, damnation or anything. But uh, it's a good comparison. It's, they claim that it's from the original. There's not any added text or any 
thing taken away. It's supposed to be all um, um, the original uh, Hebrew, and I don't know about the New Testament, Greek, I guess. I don't know, but anyway, I like it so far. And uh, see, I try to read, I, I've been, made it a habit of trying to read uh, the scriptures all the way through in a year, and I'm on my, I'm getting ready to finish up my third year. And, and I think I'm going to start this one as my fourth go around. And uh, it may take me a little longer with trying to figure out what the words are. So, but I mean, it's basically, basically it's English. And on uh, uh, one side it has, well, you know, I might not be able to see it. It has the uh, original name of the book. And then on the other side, it'll have like Second Kings. But on the other side, it'll have the original name of the book. Uh, where does the book of mark stop where does it stop yeah what what's the last verse of the book of mark mark 16 what let me look and see careful tim i think it's a trick question <laughs> i'm not gonna give him the answer it says uh verse 20 says and they went out and proclaimed it everywhere while the add-on worked with them and confirmed the word through the accompanying signs. Amen. Is there any is there any notes after between no notes, no reports, no uh nothing, uh no no outlines or anything in the book. Uh, now in the back it's got a few maps and it's got the name of some of uh a few names, a glossary with a few names in it and um, weights and measures and stuff like that, but uh, they don't have a concordance or a note outline or nothing like that in it. But if you go to the website, it'll explain a lot, a whole lot about it. Uh, what is the, uh, when was the first printing of that? What year? Wait a minute and I'll tell you, maybe. Well, I don't think it says anything about it in this Bible. I don't see anything anyway. Oh, yeah, ninth edition, it says 2022. So they sent you the ninth edition. I wonder when the, when it was first printed. I don't know. They said they've worked on, uh, they've got one that's got four different languages. It's got the English, the Paleo, Hebrew, um, and two other uh, languages in it. It's got one where you can get, it's got four different uh, languages that it that has in it. So, uh, but I just needed the English. I have hard enough time with English. I don't need all these. <laughs> uh, but, uh, so, so has anybody taken the Geneva Bible and make it more manageable for someone that speaks English? Modern English, not double letter J J M C's and, and oh, I have a I have a Geneva. I have a Geneva, but the print is kind of small point. It's like nine point text or something. It's a little bit hard to read, but it reads almost exactly like the King James with the old uh, archaic language. It, it's uh, basically the same. Style of writing as the King James. Does the King, well, I think it's worse than the King James. They, they rip uh, off. The one I have is the 1599 copy uh, from 1599, which is not the first Geneva Bible. But 1599 is close enough to 1611 that the language is the same. As far as the, King the, the hitherto and the therefores and the these and the thous, it's about the same. Okay. Well, Tim, what I meant by that when I asked you is, I really meant, how do you like it so far? <laughs> <laughs> well, I haven't really got into it yet. Uh, uh, I just, uh, you know, <laughs> I haven't done any uh, blowing on the show far yet. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna say uh, the best Bible out there is the message. 
you know, it's sad. So many people will not do anything other than the King James Version. And they, they, that's the only one. They act like the people that translate was so infallible. But yet, how many people was it that uh, got together and translated the King James Version? Uh, it's like, how many scholars were like 52 scholars or something like that? But they think that they're so infallible. And the King James Version is the only version that's uh, the true that anything else is we shouldn't even read. I mean, I run into people like that all the time. But what Bible do you read? And I say, I read the Word of God. And, uh, they'll say, well, what translation? I say, does it matter? And they say, oh, yeah, it matters. Only the King James Version is all you're supposed to read. I say, well, I don't agree. <laughs> well, blow their mind say to some children. Yeah. <laughs> That's actually a good one. Um, so, I've, I've asked, when, when did it switch? Because the Protestant Reformation with the Geneva Bible, it wasn't the King James. When the first King James Bibles were enormous and they were chained to the pulpit, nobody could take them home. The Geneva Bible came off the printing press, very, very similar to what you and I carry today. Day one, it was meant to be a family Bible that somebody could buy and take home and carry around. And that's the Bible that the pilgrims carried over here. So yeah. there's a moment in time this continent switched to the King James. And if anybody knows when that happened, I'd, I'd love to hear it because I, I can't figure it out. Now, in the original King James, did it have uh, the book of Jasher and Enoch and Maccabees and all that in it? So where so did they come from? Yeah, it did. It had Maccabees. If you have, if you it, had, have, it did yeah. have the uh, Apocrypha, the original King James had the Apocrypha. Right. If at you, the time it was originally printed. If you if you have a family King James, you know the big one with all that, it has some of those books in it, but they're in a third section. Yeah. Say that people took them out of the Bible. They were in. You have Old Testament, New Testament, then you have this other piece of paper that says this is the Apocrypha, and it's labeled as stuff that you don't really want to pay attention to too much. It didn't have Jasher. It did, I think it had Enoch, it Jubilees, Tobit. Uh, it has a few of the Apocrypha books, but Jasher, the book of Adam and Eve, uh, there's another one out there so far out that They've never, never been in, right? Jubilees. There's Jubilees. And... Jubilees is in the Catholic Bible, but but when they were in, quote, in the Bible, they were def technically between the verse, but they were in a section that was marked, you know, red light district, right? Be buyer beware. You know, you know what I mean? So they, so they weren't, weren't they weren't the inspired word of God. Is that what you're saying? True story. Yeah, that's what apocrypha means. Apocrypha means it's it's information that is worthy for consideration, but we don't know who the author is. It's not inspired. We can't verify it. And you then, notice how close the word apocrypha, apocrypha is to the word apostasy. Very close. <laughs> the, the next section after apocrypha is pseudographia. That's where Enoch and Jasher and uh, and, and these four which means that they're, I don't know, Tagore will tell us the definition of pseudographia, but it's bad. Well, <laughs> it's not, it's not but a positive. But word. in the scripture somewhere, doesn't it mention the book of Jasher? Uh, some of those, uh, I, I thought that there was some of those books mentioned in the Bible somewhere. Uh, Jude mentions uh, the book of Enoch, I think. Enoch. He quotes from it, but, you know, the Apostle Paul quoted from one of the poets, from the ancient poets, right, when he went to Athens. So it doesn't mean that because Jude quoted from it that it has a high level of credibility. It just means it was a reference to reinforce the point he was making. But I understand your po what you're trying to say is what a lot of people will use as to substantiate the credibility. 
right. of the, uh, the pseudo-pagrapha books. And then they're, they're interesting history, some of them. And uh, for sure, I mean, Maccabees is a valuable book to understand that period. But, you know, you spend some time in those books and you realize that they have very limited attraction to spiritual matters. So it'd be basically like going to the book of uh, a book that Josephus wrote and uh, reading his writings would be in the same uh, level, right? Mm. Or no? Um. He's a first century historian for sure. So he wrote we wrote from his perspective, and I'm sure a lot of what he what he recorded was good, was true. I don't spend any time in, in it though. I, I mean I don't give my time and energy to to Josephus. Oh no, I, I just heard I'm, I'm not a historian, so that makes sense, right? But if you're heavy into first century history, you would want to spend time there. Josephus cover to cover, um, and it's uh, uh, Maccabees is similar. Uh, Maccabees one and two Maccabees are good. If you're only going to read one, just read one Maccabees, and it's a history. It's right. Um, and uh, if you read it, you will understand Matthew twenty four better, a lot better. Uh, because when they talk about the abomination of desolation, uh, if you read Maccabees, you realize Yeshua is not giving them new information. It already happened. And the first time the abomination of desolation was set up in the holy place was during the Maccabean revolt during those days. And so if you read that, the Maccabees is a place where uh, in Isaiah, a period of time where you, you know, you won't re you won't sow when another man reap and you won't uh and, and you'll be able to eat your own produce it, de it describes peace in this very specific fashion maccabees time in written court has ever experienced that uh so it's it's very valuable uh it's very enlightening uh same with josephus if you if you read josephus he oftentimes sounds like paul because he has a very similar uh, he's a Levite and a Roman who goes around trying to keep these cities from revolting against Rome and starting a war, and he ultimately fails. Uh, but he has authority to write letters to these different cities in Judea and counsel them, and, and ultimately he lives through the destruction of the temple, and he is awarded by the Roman governor the ability to... Uh, to write the history of people so it doesn't get lost. So so both of those works are worth looking at because they 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 don't pretend it to be scripture. That's the big, the big, you know, huge positive. Josephus isn't trying to make himself out to be some kind of prophet. Neither is the guy who wrote first Maccabees or second Maccabees, right? And by first, second, third, fourth Maccabees are three different letters to Jews uh, and nobody knows who they were written by so it didn't get to be in the Bible um, so anyway sorry hogging again but you guys steered into something I knew about <laughs> and what would Hanukkah be without Maccabees Wouldn't be there. It would be a Jewish legend, which which generally is what it is, right? It's a real thing, uh, but they didn't have eight candles. Um, the funny story about me and Josephus is that when I was reading it, I was doing a lot of travel, and I was on a Southwest airline plane, and and you know Southwest doesn't have assigned seating, so I was sitting in like a ABC seat, ABC. And a rabbi, a full-blown, you know, black, you know, decked out rabbi guy about my age, we were, I was in my 30s and he was in his 30s, gets on the plane and he sits in the only seat on the plane that can see what I'm reading. 
And we had a great conversation because I was reading Josephus and he's like, why are you reading that Goyim boy? Right. <laughs> and, and we, and he said, and so that's when he learned that there are Christians who keep Sukkot, and he was confused as heck about that. And we had a really good conversation. Um, really wanted to make sure I knew that Josephus was a traitor. And I'm like, I, I know he's a traitor, but that's why we have this book, Rabbi. <laughs> if, we, if he wasn't a traitor, we wouldn't have the book. You know, he would have been killed. So it's kind of a fun story. I wish I'd have got that guy's card. As I have more questions for him today than I did then. So. Did he have the bumps on his forehead? Uh, he did not have Tefillin between his eyes. He just had the oh, okay. No, I meant from bowing and, and praying to the wall, <laughs> and smacking his head against the wall. So he wasn't just a, a rabbi. He was of theology at Miami University. Oh. Yeah, <laughs> I, I really, I had a great conversation with that fellow. Mm -hmm. so, all right. Hey, well, Mark Kappa uh, speaking next week. Hey, Gore, I enjoyed your presentation tonight. Uh, I'm going to take off now. It was good fellowshipping with y'all tonight. Mm -hmm. Y'all have a good Sabbath. You can join in the morning if you want. Move on. Take care. Welcome, everybody, I'm out too. Good night. You guys, you guys can have some airtime without me hogging it. Good night. Bye.